Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, Monday afternoon, and um, we're a couple weeks into having um, school back operating in the district, at least in some form. And uh, I figured it's time for me to give you an update as generally some things that are happening um, in the district. You know, back when COVID started, uh, I used to come to the um, YouTube a bit to kind of talk about what's going on and what's the best information we have at this point and what do we think is going to happen next. It's been a little bit of time. We did some, over the summer, we did some public forums, we did some other stuff, but it's, I've kind of waned a little bit in terms of the amount of uh, communicating in this way that I've done. So I figured it was about time for me to um, get back into the swing of things in terms of making sure you're as up to date as you can be as to what's happening in terms of district operations. So um, so it's Monday and maybe um, what I hope to do is periodically release some of these again um, to make sure that, again, you're informed as to what we're doing, what's happening in the state context around us, um, how might some changes in um, what's happening with the, the virus or regulations impact what's happening with our, our uh, programs that we can offer to families, um, all those types of things. So let me start with what the state announced last week. The, there was a, a statement that came out that the state was moving schools from step two to step three, um, which is a less restrictive uh, setup. Um, when we originally went into um, the building and planning process, uh, the state had asked us to plan to go into step two and, and meet our, the restrictions that were available through step two. Step one, for those of you who haven't Paid, you know, if you haven't paid a ton of attention to this, I get it. But step one was the was we were fully out. That was back in March and April when we got into um, concern about the spread, and we were in step one, which is fully remote instruction for all students across the state. And then um, as we moved into the summer, we did summer planning. We moved into step two, and step two included social distancing, all the other regulations you've heard us talk about over the course of the uh, summer as we were trying to do our planning, and then into um, into the start of school. So, um, so then they had this a big announcement. Oh, we're, gonna, we're moving from step two to step three. And the reality is, and I want to make sure people are aware of this, is that it doesn't change a lot in terms of the big things that have an impact on the amount of in-person instruction that we're offering our students. The, thing, the biggest thing that was affected was it started to allow um, interscholastic uh, athletics. So the, the, your classic um, you know, um, opportunity for athletics between schools uh, and around the state, and that was um, freed up at the high school and even at the middle school level if we wanted to, uh, to loosen things up in that regard. It also included a little bit of uh, adjustments to the ways in which we may be able to utilize gymnasiums and cafeterias. Um, but the big thing that did not include was it doesn't include any changing um, changes in their recommendations around social distancing. So... Um, so that is what we're grappling with right now, because I think when this got announced, there were a bunch of people who were like, great, here we go. Schools are going to be totally open again. It's just a matter of time, and we're going to be back to five days or four days or some type of um, intensified amount of in-person instruction. Um, but the reality is that, that it really didn't change a heck of a lot around the key things that really constrain how many students we can have are in person instruction. Now, as a district, we continue to, you know, we continue to emphasize student and staff, staff, staff safety, but we also believe, kind of as a stated kind of way in which to think about this, that the more in person instruction we can do, the better. The challenge, like I said, is that we're still at the high school level, the middle school level is still a recommendation of six feet of social distance um, between people in terms of our setup. Uh, and that at the lowest grades, they've been talking about three, two, six. It's a little amorphous. Now, we originally built around six feet because the change that came that had a sliding scale that it can include to something as low as three um, was um, something that came very late and we didn't feel it was appropriate for us to uh, try to scramble at the last minute to make it work. So we've been operating off of, um, off of six feet at the lowest grades as well. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to, we know that even if we slide back to three feet, if we started using three feet because we've had, we've been reasonably successful so far in terms of keeping people safe and being smart, that if we slide things back in the lowest grades to three feet, we still cannot get all students in at three feet distance from one another. So we're not in a position with, even with step three to say, let's open up schools for everybody again. And that's challenging. So what we are looking at is what can we do now that we've been at it for several weeks 
And we still, we ask people to make a commitment through the end of quarter one. Um, and um, so families have made those commitments to certain forms of instruction. What can we do in the short run if we wanted to offer opportunities for additional students to have some more time in school? So we're having a bunch of dialogue about that. Um, right now, we haven't come to any final conclusions, but we're trying to explore it because like you, we, you know, we understand how important it is to have kids right here um, for in-person instruction. So more to come. Uh, stay tuned. Eighth grade. Um, some of you, um, you know, eighth grade parents, I know obviously this has a huge impact on you, uh, what happened where we've had eighth grade students totally remote the entire time that we've been back. And some of you, some others of you in the district might, might be aware of that, might not be. What happened with eighth grade was a couple things. One, we, um, we had surveys that had gone out. We had multiple surveys asking people, what do you think you might do? Do you think you're going to be in person? Do you think you're going to be remote? Um, what do you think you want to have happen for your uh, child? And through our first couple of surveys, it looked like we were in, we were in pretty good shape where we'd be able to handle um, the social distancing, meeting the standards set from the state, and be able to get um, students in uh, to our spaces on a two-day rotation, which is what we're doing now. Monday, Tuesday for some kids, Thursday, Friday for others, and then uh, remote on Wednesdays, and then a fully remote option for some families. Uh, but what, what ended up happening is in our last survey, when we asked for commitments from people, we had a, a, a lot of eighth grade parents change their minds and move to, I want to go to a hybrid um, instruction. And at that point, we started to explore, okay, we can't fit all these kids, even on two days where we have half the kids in and half the kids out. With the social distancing requirements, we cannot fit all these kids in Riverside Middle School. So what are we going to do or in classrooms? So we started to explore the gymnasium uh, and breaking up the gymnasium into parts, uh, use the ca utilize the cafeteria. Uh, and we had um, purchased uh, some wall systems, some temporary wall systems we could use to break up um, part of the, um, of the gymnasium to make it all work. Well, a couple things happened right before, right as we were getting about a week away from school starting. One was that those walls became backordered and they weren't going to be available through, through at least the middle of November. Uh, the other thing uh, that happened was we started to get teachers in and as we were putting out desks and kind of exploring what was going on, what became really clear in the gym is that we were, that it is a lot noisier than we thought that ventilation system was going to be. Um, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but it's like a jet engine over the top of the head of the, of the gym. And we started to become concerned about the ability of teachers to teach uh, in that environment in an effective way and to be anything other than just kind of a holding tank for kids. And we just didn't think that was appropriate. So we initially pushed out uh, to remote instruction. We've been exploring a bunch of different, we know this is a big strain on families. Uh, we're exploring a lot of different options right now, which include the possibility of utilizing part of the high school. Um, also, um, some other ways in which we can do some noise reduction, but we don't want to affect ventilation, which is such an essential component of keeping everybody uh, safe and having clean and safe air. So um, again, we're moving closer to um, to some um, some new approaches to what we're doing with the eighth grade, but we're not finalized yet. Uh, and we are sympathetic to what everybody's going through on that front. Um, I want to take a minute to just remind people, we've, people have been really good about um, about what needs to happen in terms of staying home and when you should st when uh, students should stay home when staff should stay home and I just wanted to run through one more time just to clarify when is it that you should be staying home so um, here's the stuff if you're if you test positive for COVID nineteen yes you should be staying home your students should be staying home uh, if you show symptoms um, of COVID nineteen and these are I'm going to run through them really quick cough. Shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, a fever over 104, chills, fatigue, uh, muscle pain, body aches, uh, headaches, sore throat, uh, a loss of taste or smell, uh, congestion, runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. If you're experiencing those symptoms, staff or students, um, then initially you need to stay home until, we, until you can connect with your primary care uh, physician. Uh, and your doctor and um, get to a point where you can have, where the doctor gives you clearance to come back to school. Now we can, um, a COVID test sometimes is what's necessary in order to do that. Um, but it, what's most important to us is just this information from a doctor. Um, if you've been in close contact with somebody who ends up testing positive um, for COVID-19 and you realize that you were in close contact with them, you were 
you know, less than six feet apart for more than 15 minutes, that would be close contact, um, then you need to, um, then you potentially need to quarantine and you need to get tested. Um, again, we go back to the fever, if you have a fever over 104. And the last one is, I'm going to flash up the map in just a second to, re to remind people of this, but that non-essential travel. If you were involved in non-essential travel, um, non-work related uh, type stuff, and you, pat, you're, and you visit a county in um, the northeastern part of the United States, which Vermont has deemed a yellow or red county, which is based on the number of um, people that are currently active COVID cases in that county, then you need to quarantine in Vermont when you return, you need to quarantine either for 14 days to make sure you don't have any symptoms as a result of potentially catching COVID or seven days and then getting a negative COVID test. So, um, so I'm gonna flash that information up real quick right about now, so I can quickly show you what I'm talking about and where you can find it. Hey, hello everyone. Okay, so here we are in the, um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, this is a group that tracks all the data from around um, the northeastern part of the United States and gives out the information about uh, cross-state travel. I know a lot of you know this, but I just wanted to review really quick. This is where you go. Um, this is the web address. When you do, you get here to all this information about what's happening in regards to cross-state uh, cross travel. Um, and the um, as you scroll down, here's the most important thing. Now this is a map that used to be updated on, on Fridays, which was a pain because people wanted to go off and um, go, to, go to places and they would find out you know, at 11 o'clock on Friday that their weekend plan was potentially in jeopardy. Um, and, um, but that is now updated on Tuesdays. This changed just recently. So here's our map. This is the map of the Northeastern part of the United States. Um, if you go to areas that you quote unquote, you know, if you go to yellow or red areas, um, these are places that have a uh, higher, um, than 400, uh, active cases per million in the particular County. Um, if you go to those places to visit driving through and not, you know, stopping for gas or just like that is okay. Or if you're going for essential travel, which would include work. That's okay. But if you go to places like, for example, York, and we went through this with a lot of families at the end of the summer, if you go into York County, Maine, which includes York Beach, uh, right now it's, an, it's a county that's in red. If you were to go this upcoming weekend to York County uh, after the Tuesday, if Tuesday is still in the red, if you go to York County and um, you hit the beaches, you stay for the weekend, and then you come back, you'd have to quarantine. Vermont would expect you to quarantine for 14 days or to go after seven days and get a test. That also applies, you know, not just for yellow and red counties. Uh, let's see, yellow counties like Hillsborough, New Hampshire, where, um, where uh, Manchester, New Hampshire is, um, but um, and all around Boston and everything around some of the metropolitan D.C. area, but anything outside of this area. So if you were to travel to other parts of the United States beyond Ohio, south of Virginia, um, you were to go abroad, the expectation is that you are doing um, some, you're going to quarantine. So uh, please be aware of this and please make sure you're checking this on a regular basis um, and that you're being um, thoughtful about, about travel uh, and then thoughtful about, you know, whether uh, you, you as a staff member or you as a parent are in a position to, to either come to school or send your child to school. All right. Thanks. Okay. A couple other quick things. Thanks uh, on that. Please keep being diligent uh, about that stuff. Let's keep everybody safe. Um, I also want to mention we're in a really, we are in the midst of, um, in a, we are right at the crossroads of so many things that are happening in society right now here in the district. Um, you have all the COVID stuff, but also we're right in the middle and have been for months, right in the middle of the conversation around race. Um, a few um, months ago, we um, we went through um, a conversation about a book. Um, we had a, um, uh, a request from a set of parents who felt that a book was inappropriate. Um, the, um, and that book was connected in part due to pers some perspectives around uh, racial stuff um, and also the, the uh, way in which uh, police officers were portrayed. So we went through a whole conversation about that. Um, we had not that, not that long ago, or you know, around the same time, had a new um, staff member uh, um, who was a person of color resign 
and, um, and indicate that they were concerned about the way they were treated. Um, so we are in the midst of a, having an external investigator investigate that, that information to report back to the board um, about that. It was a sad, sad moment for all of us in the, in the district to, to have that occur. Um, but we are taking it really seriously and we're having, like I said, an internal, uh, inve external investigator uh, take a look at it. We're also in the midst of dueling, um, it looks like dueling um, uh, petitions in the community. Uh, we have a student group who, who came to uh, me to discuss, would it be possible to um, fly the Black Lives Matter um, flag at Springfield High School? And so we had some conversation about that, and some dialogue about what might be possible there. Um, I'm going to have to have some conversation with the board about what are some of the things to consider uh, around um, around um, thinking about the possibility of flying a, um, a flag um, around student voice, around what do we do with new citizens, uh, students who are learning how to become citizens as they grow into adulthood. So we're going to have some good dialogue about that. And I know there's a corresponding, it sounds like there's a corresponding petition in the community to try to stop that from happening. Um, so in the midst of all this, this is some really like um, challenging stuff for communities to talk about and face. And I've watched in our own community, us in our school community, us work really hard to try to engage those issues while simultaneously being really uncomfortable at times, which is, which is good. Um, and I've watched communities around us who are trying to deal with issues of race in a new way. Um, you know, after the, after the, um, the death of George Floyd and the, um, and what's happening, you know, the, um, um, people of color disproportionately affected by COVID, um, that there's a new engagement around those types of issues. And there clearly is here in Springfield. And I would just ask as we go through that, that we all, everybody, regardless of viewpoint, that we all work really hard at being um, really civil and respectful in our dialogue, respectful of each other's views, um, are of respectful of each other's kind of opinions and feelings about these issues, and that we give everybody an opportunity to kind of air their perspectives on things. Um, and then come to what, you know, what we feel like is the, is the right decision um, as a community uh, around a variety of these issues, not just a flag. So uh, a couple other things real quick, and this is getting long and I apologize. Um, just a, I want to give people a heads up, a, a renewed update. We had a year, a year ago, more than a year ago, the legislature had passed a new le uh, legislation around lead testing in schools in water. And they created a new standard that was higher than the EPA standard um, of four parts per billion, that things that should be less than four parts per billion of lead present in any, um, if you measured any, um, uh, you took samples from any taps or any uh, faucets around the district. Um, and they did this all over the state. So we did, uh, that initially came out in June. In the fall of last year, we did our first set of testing. Uh, and I put out a letter to folks saying, hey, look, this testing is about to happen. Here's what's going on with it. Uh, we collected samples from everything in the district. Then in November, we got back information. Some of our stuff passed. Some of our stuff didn't. Uh, the things that didn't pass, we took offline. So they weren't being used by anybody um, in the district. Then we did our first level of remediation. So what we did is we switched out all the faucets, uh, all the, you know, anything, um, any of those receptacles. We switched out all that stuff. And then we tested again. Now we would have got our our second wave of testing back right around in the right in the midst of the COVID um, stuff, so that was all delayed. And we got the stuff back in it looked like June ish of this year. Uh, into it started in June and rolled into August. And then we've done our our second wave of now remediation with like okay, what else is even after we did the faucets? Are there still some ones that are over the limits? And uh, we put in um, uh, close to the faucet. Um, like filtration systems that are close to the faucet. We really think that's probably going to take care of everything. Our second wave, our now third wave of testing has gone to the state. Um, and so we're hoping to get that back soon. And when we do, we're assuming this will take care of, uh, of everything. Uh, but when we do, I'll make sure I get back to you one more time on, on that. A couple other quick things uh, before I let you go. Uh, just let you know that we're working on a, a new survey for all stakeholders in the community. Um, this is for staff, students, families, um, about the experience so far this fall. What's going well? What's not? What are you hoping to see? And we're still working through the development of that. And I hope to have it out to you soon because we, again, have an eye on the next, I mean, the next big possible shift in things, I believe, is going to be in that early November 
end of the first quarter period that we talked about before, that's when the, a major, if there's going to be a major shift, it might be around that period of time because that's when we ask people to commit. Uh, we want to have information from you to help us inform um, that decision-making process. Similar to a lot of the surveying we've done before, we want to do another wave. So you can anticipate that's coming soon. I hope to have more information out to you um, in the next week or so, hopefully, about when that might be. Uh, last thing is I just want to put in a pitch for substitute teaching. Um, we uh, continue to need uh, substitute teachers, um, and we're having um, – you know, conversations about how to make that job more manageable for folks, uh, something that they want to participate in. And, uh, and I hope that uh, if you're out there, um, you know, both as a job, but also as a public service, I hope that you would consider applying to be a substitute teacher here in the district. Um, it, they are essential, um, essential jobs for us. Um, things that are unbelievably important in terms of making our operations work on a daily basis. And, um, and it's under even more strain as a result of um, coming back in this strange form with a global pandemic going on. So, um, so I'd ask you to just kind of think about that as a possibility. All right, I'm 18 minutes in, way too long. Probably I lost most of you a while ago. Um, but, um, but I did want to just you know, thank you again for uh, the, the patience, the flexibility, and the kindness which you have collectively kind of uh, sent the, direct, the direction of the district while we, we've been trying to work through all this and do the best we can for you and your families. Uh, it's unbelievably appreciated, and, um, and I hope that we continue to um, continue to earn that from you. Uh, we're going to work really hard to do it. So best to you and your families, and uh, I hope to be back in touch soon with another update. Thanks.